the, uh, the design of the, the, the lectures this particular day, the presentations this particular day, which focused really on the pre-Cambrian, the pre-flood, the flood, uh, post-flood boundary, or flood, pre-flood boundary, it was, it was really my intent in suggesting that we have a, a, a day of, of focus on this to focus on things we don't know much about. I don't know that that's, that issue has come across. Each one of us, I think, has tried to make it sound like we understand what in the world we're talking about. Uh, but uh, when, it, when it comes to reconstructing Earth history, um, I, I don't know, I'm, I've, I'd like to create what I'm about to describe to, to help people understand it. But it is as if, if you have a picture that you are going to make into a jigsaw puzzle. So you, you create the picture, uh, you then chop it up into a jigsaw puzzle with all the pieces, you know, in that fashion. Now, let us take the jigsaw puzzle pieces and uh, mix them up and then uh, uh, make another jigsaw from that. Okay, so you rearrange all the pieces on the, and then you glue them all together or whatever in that new arrangement. Now let's make a new jigsaw puzzle of that, that mess and then take those pieces, jiggle them up and fuse them together and then make a third jigsaw puzzle uh, out of that. Now put the pieces back together again. You might find it fairly easy to put the first order jigsaw puzzle piece together and realize that you now have pieces of further, of an earlier puzzle that you now have to cut up and somehow rearrange and put together. When you, alas, have discovered that, that new picture, you realize it's a picture of further puzzle pieces that have been rearranged from a previous time. And you then have to cut that up, rearrange it, and put it back together again. The farther you reach back in time in geology, uh, the more of those uh, uh, successive jigsaw puzzle pieces we have. We look at the recent geology, hey, that's almost no-brainer. Easy to put the puzzle pieces together. But the farther we go back in time, the more the pieces have been arranged, rearranged. The old rocks of the earth, uh, in fact, have been rearranged a number of times. And to make it worse, we've got in creationism a catastrophe or two that really muddles the pieces up. Uh, so the farther you go back in time in creationist history, it's a really substantial challenge. Uh, you can do the post-flood Arfaxadian period fairly well in reconstruction. As soon as you move into the flood, you've got a major rearrangement. And the more difficult, the, more, the farther back in the flood you go, the worse it gets. It's even worse if you want to look, if you want to um, figure out what's going on in the pre-flood world, because it's got all the rearrangements of the entire flood and the post-flood uh, that have been superimposed upon the data. <clears throat> that, that sort of thing, in one sense, would probably make most people go, ah, I don't want to do it, I'll deal with this, I'll deal with the post-flood, you know, it's easier, easier to deal with. Uh, for some of us, uh, like myself, I like the greater challenge, the, 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 more, the more successive uh, reiterations of the data, scramblings of the data, uh, almost the, the better it is. Uh, but it is challenging. And uh, there is much, much, much about the pre-flood world we do not understand. And there's much about those pre-flood rocks that we are only just beginning to understand. There's lots of them. There's, tens of thousands of feet of these rocks in some places, and we have, there's been very little work done on them, partly because there's so few of us to do, do the work, uh, but also because of the challenge of the interpretation. And a further challenge, I, I suppose you'd have to throw in there is uh, some of the things that Andrew were, was talking about. We have to consider what God might have created in the beginning. So perhaps he created a, an earth with a jigsaw puzzle already in place. Um, and we might be reconstructing a history that never happened. 
uh, in, in those rocks. And that's a challenge. Where is the, where's the line um, where actually creation begins? What I wanted to do is to uh, consider at least one, <clears throat> one example of reconstructing uh, some of Earth history, specifically a time before the flood, based upon some of this scrambled uh, evidence that we have. And it's uh, specifically something that ultimately I would interpret as a hydrothermal uh, biome. I first want to look at the data as it's uh, often understood in the conventional, uh, in conventional wisdom. Uh, there is, in fact, a superphylum or above the level of phylum uh, stratomorphic series in the, uh, uh, in the fossil record. Uh, so we're talking above super, above phylum would be kingdom. Kingdom level sequence of fossils that uh, uh, evolution maintains can be explained by evolution and might be a challenge to other worldviews. And it's, um, it's, it's really easiest seen in the fact that the Precambrian has no macrofossils. In other words, no, macro, no fossils you can see with the naked eye. They're, they're, the fossils we have are microfossils. Uh, as a matter of fact, no valid, what we now understand to be valid fossils uh, from the Precambrian were understood until 1954. Before that, there were claims of fossils from the Precambrian, uh, but they have been reinterpreted as non-fossil material. And uh, it, it was, uh, it's only with the advent of the application of the microscope to the Precambrian rocks that we discovered bacterial fossils uh, that we actually could see real fossils in the Precambrian. Also, a closer examination of the rocks just immediately below the Cambrian uh, revealed that there were actually, but there are not very, very many places in the world where these rocks exist. In the, um, on the North American continent, we have the Great Unconformity. That Great Unconformity is found on most continents. And it's very difficult to find a place where the Unconformity doesn't exist. Steve made reference to one place, the Mojave, where we have a continuous sequence through the unconform Great Unconformity. You could run the Great Unconformity into a sequence of, of sediments. So that's an erosional surface, most of the places on the planet. But there's a few places, there's 12 of them, about 12 places on the planet where there's the, there are the rocks that eroded away in most places are actually preserved. That's not very many places. They've only recently been, relatively recently in the last 30 years, been identified and recognized uh, as such. And they've been, been able to stick, in a sense, sort of like stick some things in between the Cambrian and what used to be considered the Precambrian into uh, the uppermost Proterozoic. And then in fact, more recently, they've even inserted another uh, another system into the, into, the, into the system beneath the Cambrian as the Vendian based upon uh, fossils, macro fossils that have been found uh, below the traditional Cambrian in those few places where we actually have uh, good preservation. And so in those places, such as in the Mojave, uh, we have a sequence of fossils that in the Archean, we have exclusively bacteria and something called stromatolites you've already been introduced to and we'll come back to in a moment here. Uh, but these are all bacterial or bacterial related. Uh, we assume that the stromatolites are basically built by bacteria, even though it's rare to actually find fossils of the bacteria in the stromatolites. Uh, based upon similarity with stromatolites in the present, uh, minuscule uh, stromatolites, uh, diminutive stromatolites in the present compared to the monsters in the, uh, in the fossil record. Uh, the modern stromatolites are formed by bacteria, so we presume that these are bacterial. So we've got literally thousands of feet of sediment in places where all we've got are bacteria. 
Then as you move up into younger sediments, you get to a point where in addition to the bacteria, bacteria are found throughout the biostratigraphic column, in addition to bacteria, you, are, you will find, begin to find some algae. Single-celled algae, um, uh, unicellular algae, but algae nonetheless, and that's a significant difference from bacteria, very much larger organism. It's a eukaryotic organism. Uh, cells are about 10 times the set, minimum of 10 times the size of a typical bacterium. They also include uh, cell components, cell, uh, cell organelles, such as, uh, uh, such as nuclei. <clears throat> A little bit further up, usually not very far, very much further up in the pile, you begin to see protists, the algae being photosynthetic uh, microorganisms, more specifically the unicellular photosynthetic microorganisms. Then we get unicellular um, non-photosynthetic organisms uh, that uh, we would know of as protists. For example, in most places around the world where these things first show up, uh, they show up as... Um, uh, let's see, VSOs, VSOs, and that's hidden, uh, that's an acronym for vase-shaped objects, <laughs> or vase-shaped objects. Really funny little things that look like little vases that you put flowers in. So these are VSOs. Uh, they are understood to be protists, or the tests of protists, in other words, the, uh, the shells of, of protists. The algae showed up, uh, show up earlier as what are called acrotarchs. They're thought to be the uh, sort of analogous to the spores <laughs> of the fungi, the resistant structures that are formed when the environmental conditions are, are, are difficult, and they, they form these protective capsules, often extremely ornate, really fascinating uh, structures. Again, ugh, we... we we believe with a high degree of probability that these are, in fact, algae, although they don't exist in the present. They're really restricted to the early uh, part of the fossil record. Really interesting uh, things. So we, we begin getting uh, acrotarchs, uh, and, and they become very abundant. We begin getting uh, protists in the form of VSOs. And then there's a point at which, in most of these localities, and now almost all 12 of the localities, we get a group of organisms known as the Ediacaran fauna, named after the type locality in Australia, Ediacara, uh, where these were first discovered. Uh, this is a world of uh, very strange animals. They're macrofossils. They're, in fact, they're very large uh, macrofossils. Uh, it's um, typically, you know, they're, they're a foot, two foot in size, uh, sort of, they have very few small organisms. They're only preserved, uh, almost always only preserved in sandstone. Uh, sandstone isn't good at preserving things in micro detail, so the very large size is probably partly a consequence of what they're preserved in. Uh, very characteristic biota, they're flat. Organisms, all of them are flat organisms. They're, they're described as um, uh, mattress organisms or um, uh, they, because they, they seem to be, they, they look very much like the flotation devices you might lay on in, in the water. Uh, you can blow them up and then you get tubes and, and but they're woven. Uh, together, the, some of them look like worms. That's thought to be look like a worm. Doesn't look much like a worm, but uh, that's they are uh, a large, flat-bodied uh, organisms, soft-bodied, no hard parts. Above them, invariably following them, although you sometimes have a fauna that continue, you have another group of organisms known as the Tomotion uh, fauna, uh, named after the Tomot uh, area of Russia. Uh, these are really small. Uh, they are uh, almost all cone-shaped uh, uh, calcium carbonate shells. <laughs> you don't know what they are. Uh, but <laughs> they could be little spicules on the skin of a soft-bodied animal. They could be a shell in which an organism actually lives. In other words, is an organism smaller than that? The little guys are little. Uh, the largest one, I think, is about an inch long or something like that. They're really, really small. Uh, 
So they could be structures on the outside of an organism or an organism lives within them. Or maybe there's another possibility. There's all sorts of, in the fossil record, we have these kind of structures inside organisms. So who knows? We really don't know. Um, but you'll have a layer of the Timotian fauna before you move, continuing on upward, you get your trilobites. Uh, the lowest uh, layer of trilobites known as the Atbanian uh, trilobites and the Atbanian fauna. And there's this, in, again, an invariable sequence. There's only 12 sites, as I said, where, where you have these sediments preserved. But in most of those sites, we have all of these in the same order. And, uh, and it, it's just the fact that you have an order, even if we don't know what in the world they are. <laughs> Is, is an interesting, uh, interesting issue. Why is it that they have an order? Of course, evolution would say you just evolved one organism into another. And they might challenge us to say, well, how is it that you can have, if you can preserve bacteria, surely you can preserve other organisms. So, I mean, especially if you've got uh, spores flying through the air, uh, which are very resistant, easily preserved. Pollen flying through the air, easily preserved. Even if you're a long ways from everything else, why don't you have anything else but bacteria preserved in tens of thousands of feet of sediment? It looks as if, and it's the easiest explanation, the only thing that existed on the planet at the time these things were formed is, in fact, bacteria. So it looks like there's a long period of time in Earth history where all that existed were bacteria. Then there was a significant period of time, because we're talking still about thousands of feet of sediment in some cases, where you have bacteria plus algae, as if the back, some of the bacteria evolved into algae. And that's all that existed on the planet for a very long time. The algae is not. Uh, these acrotarchs are somewhat resistant. Uh, and that's why we probably find them. But again, if there were, if there's real spores, real uh, pollen, surely you'd have those things around. So the evolutionary explanation is that only bacteria existed here. Bacteria evolved into algae here. We evolved our protists from other, probably other bacteria uh, here, and um, and so on. And it's an easiest. It's a, it's the most elegant explanation for these creatures. Um, and so that brings us to a, a location that Steve has already alluded to uh, in the East Mojave Desert at the Kingston Range. We have uh, a nice place where the sediments are stacked up, at, are bent up at about 45 degrees. And so you can walk through lots of sediment uh, in a relatively short distance, although it is the, you know, the desert, and that sort of thing. But if you start at, uh, you got things stacked up like this. If you start down here, the sediments at this end are only, only contain, the only fossils are bacterial fossils. Uh, you get the VSMs uh, at this point in the, in the stack. Uh, you get the Ediacaran fauna over here, and there's an awful lot of sediment in between these things, okay? Uh, we're talking uh, thousands of feet of sediment. Uh, very soon thereafter, immediately above the Ediacaran, you've got Timotian Shelley fauna known. And then um, very soon after that, we got the Atbanian trilobites. And it's a very dramatic uh, uh, appearance of trilobites here. So you can literally walk through a continuous sequence of these, uh, the, these sediments and fossils. Uh, and it's not just true here, as I said. It's, it's true in the other locations where this sort of thing is preserved. Uh, it's a total of 15,000 feet of sediment that you can walk through like this. So you're walking through thousands of feet, 7,000 feet, all bacteria. That's all you have. Okay, and uh, I'm not, I don't want to disparage bacteria because I love them. They're wonderfully diverse and mag, but it's that, why isn't there anything else question uh, that uh, you have. And, um, and then there's another pretty close to 7,000 feet where you got bacteria plus uh, the, the one-celled eukaryotic organisms. 
before you finally get uh, what some people think are the more interesting things. Um, it's uh, when you move from, as Steve has already alluded to, if you back off of the, the, that area to the west of the Grand Canyon, move towards the Grand Canyon, you get to where there's a great unconformity uh, that, um, that is, that's there, and you're missing all of those, all of those sediments. Uh, there's one place in Nankuit Butte where we, uh, we get uh, up close to those, but we're still missing a bunch of sediments even there. But in the Grand Canyon, you got the Chuar group here, uh, which is exclusively the only fossils in the lower part of the Chuar group are bacteria. Uh, and just below, as you work your way up the Chuar, you eventually get to the 60-mile formation there on Nankuit Butte. And just below Nankuit Butte's summit there, just before, below the 60-mile formation, you get the VSMs. Uh, so even in the Grand Canyon, even though we don't have all of it, uh, we've, we, the first trilobites we get are actually significantly up into the Cambrian there, not the Atbanian trilobites, and we're missing the Timotian and we're missing the, uh, the, uh, the Ediacaran, but we are getting the first two of those, the bacteria and then the protists and algae. Uh, there's also, I don't know if, I, yeah, I've, I've got the, um, in the Chuar group, we also have the, uh, the acrotarchs and that sort of thing as well. And here we got about 25,000 feet up between the lowest sediments with bacteria up to the place where we're getting close to the, um, uh, the boundary. So we have a, a stratomorphic series. Uh, again, even though it doesn't necessarily, we don't understand these things, it is nonetheless some sort of a sequence of fossils uh, which is in different parts of the world uh, and must be or should be explained. <clears throat> so, we, the traditional interpretation is that it's an evolutionary sequence involving vast expense, expanse of time, uh, and we, so what do we do about this? Well, uh, we looked at the Grand Canyon. You've already seen some pictures from this. Uh, we observed Andrew and I, Steve and I walked at one point, then Andrew and I looked at it a little more closely. We looked at this stromatolite forest uh, where we could actually, uh, do I have that? Yeah, I have a picture here, let's do that. Where you could, these bulbous, these bumps here, when you look at them in three dimensions in places where the, the uh, sediment has eroded away to reveal them, there are these uh, mushroom-shaped structures, which when cut in cross-section, you can sort of see it here, uh, has concentric layers. It's built, it builds up in a pillar that gets larger and larger as it gets up towards the surface. Again, kind of mushroom shape. This is a hammer for, for scale. Um, that's probably, that might be me for scale. Oh, it looks like I got shorts on. That looks like Andrew for snail scale. I didn't think my camera worked, but anyway, I, uh, it's the two of us here playing around on these on these things. They're close enough together that you can walk from one to the another. You can jump from one to another, uh, and yet their their shape is such that if they if they were let's say ripped out um, of here and tossed in, they would probably be upside down. This is top heavy. So these things are all right side up in a very top heavy condition. So it would suggest that these are actually in place. They haven't been ripped up from someplace and deposited somewhere else in the flood. And it strongly suggested to us that these guys, as Steve suggested, are actually a pre-flood. Uh, you're looking at a pre-flood surface where these, these little things grew up in a forest of them and it's not seen in this picture. I don't know if I don't have a picture that shows, but you can follow this thing. We followed this thing for more than a kilometer, literally walking. You could walk from one to another for a kilometer distance. It's amazing. There's thousands of these things, a beautiful uh, locality. Um, stromatolites like these are very similar to stromatolites we have in the present. 
uh, in Shark Bay, Australia, for example, most famous locality for them, probably the area that they're just about the biggest. Uh, they can get up two to three feet in height. In the present world, that's about the biggest we've ever seen them. Uh, they're in shallow water uh, of the, uh, uh, there along the ocean. Uh, bacteria basically is, let's, let's say, they're often in an intertidal zone or associated with an intertidal zone in the present world. As the tide goes out, the bacteria will shrink into the, uh, into, the, uh, into the sand grains to protect themselves from ultraviolet light from the sun. Then when the water comes back in, they grow in between the sand grains and create a biofilm on the outside of this uh, structure. Then when the, uh, the, the tides go out again, there's usually some sand grains or whatever that get affixed to that. And so there's this alternating layer of organic, alternating layers of organic and inorganic material that grow over time. Uh, and in the present world, it's, it's a very slow process. And again, the biggest ones are only about three feet or so. These guys are significantly bigger, but they have the same structure, alternating layers of organic and inorganic material. We don't find fossils in them. We haven't, uh, nobody that I know yet has actually observed uh, the uh, uh, fossil bacteria in place in these things, but we presume that's what made them uh, as in the present. So we're talking about a forest of stromatolites built by bacteria. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and when you see this in place, and this is almost what it would have looked like then, but underwater, it's as if it's a, it's a reef structure. Of, uh, str there's enough of these things that they would, be ba they would baffle waves and function as a reef. And in other locations, uh, such as in the Mojave and other layers of the Mojave, they can be a kilometer two kilometers in size, <laughs> not, not these little guys like this, but very, very large indeed. There's places on the Russian platform where they are uh, 10 to 20 kilometers in size, huge things. Now here's one, this is, a, this is kind of a, a gully here. We're walking along and got a chance to see one in profile just before it erodes out. But here's another one that eroded out and fell over down the gully and it falls upside down. That's what you would expect it to do. Uh, so seem to, be, seem to argue that these things are actually in place and it's only when they're eroded out that they turn over to their, their proper hydrodynamic position. Uh, so it suggests to us that sometime in the past before the flood, because if these things are in place, uh, the flood would have, you'd think, ripped them up and moved them around and they'd be upside down. So it suggests that this is actually a surface that preceded the flood. It is below the boundary that Steve was, was talking about, the uh, flood, pre-flood boundary as we defined it. We used the criteria uh, that, that he defined, those five criteria, and it clearly places it, uh, the flood pre-flood boundary, above this layer. So it very well could be that this is a uh, preservation of a pre-flood world, which would suggest that there were stromatolytic reefs in, the, uh, in, in, this, in this place, which if they were formed by bacteria in the similar way as modern bacteria produce stromatolites, that would infer that there's an awful lot of time involved. We need to add to the uh, mixture, these things, the, the picture, uh, some of the pieces that have to be put together here, what are known as the upper Proterozoic diamictites. A diamictite is di to mixture. It's a mixture of two different sized rock fragments, basically. Uh, this would be like boulders inside a sandstone. Uh, and it could be rounded boulders or angular boulders inside a very different sized matrix. Uh, these are examples of, this is, this is a, the Kingston Peak Formation, which you've already heard reference to. Uh, some pictures of some of the 
uh, smaller clasts in the Kingston Peak. It's mostly sand, but it's got these, uh, in this case, cobbles, round cobbles, angular cobbles. The angular cobbles would be called a breccia. Uh, the, the rounded cobbles would be called a conglomerate. Because there's two different sized particles mixed to get two dramatically different sized particles mixed together, sand and cobbles, it's called a diamictite. Because normally, in a water, certainly in the case of water deposition, water sorts things by size very efficiently. It's, it's just, as soon as water gets involved, you, you pretty much uh, put all the boulders together, you put all the sand together, and put all the shale together. And diamictite's a strange rock. It would suggest that water wasn't involved in the, uh, in the placement of it. Uh, also, wind wasn't involved. Wind also would, uh, would uh, uh, select things according to size. So it suggests a very different mechanism for emplacement of these things. Um, among these boulders are some boulders with flat, surfaces with scrape marks on them, striations on them. Uh, so, and, and, some, and mixed also in here with these small things would be huge boulders. So you've got a diamictite with uh, sand, lots of uh, smaller cobbles and boulders, and then an occasional monster boulder in there. And some of the boulders, uh, would be striated. They're smoothed off on one side and have scratch marks. So what in the world is going on here? Uh, this was, um, we see this in Pleistocene deposits. We see this downstream of glaciers. Uh, when glaciers pick up rocks, usually rocks fall onto glaciers from above, but sometimes they scrape up rocks from below. They get affixed into the glacier. If they're fixed into the base of the glacier, the glacier drags the rock along its bottom surface and, and smooths off that one side and creates striations. Uh, also, uh, then it carries those things all the way down to the end of the glacier. There's a point at which the melting of the glacier equals the movement of the glacier. And at that point, the glacier dumps all of its material into a pile. Well, it's a pile of not just these boulders, but also uh, the sand and stuff. It's grinding some of these boulders into a fine mesh. So it ends up a pile. Uh, the moraine at the end of the glacier is a pile of small sand-sized particles mixed with boulders and cobbles, and, and including striated uh, flattened boulders. And uh, there's the occasional monster boulder that rolled on top of the glacier and gets dumped then into the, uh, into the mixture. Uh, these are all characteristics of things moved by ice. Again, it's not characteristic of things moved by water or, or wind. Uh, so these things are uh, typically a diamictite is interpreted as due to glacial activity. So we have evidence of stromatolytic reefs, which would suggest long periods of time. We've got evident, we got diamictites, which is interpreted as a glacial deposit, which is slowly deposited. So we have an awful long period of time indicated here as it's understood uh, traditionally. Uh, there's, there's some things that are a little problematic, though, in that traditional interpretation. Uh, in, uh, for example, in the superphylum sequence, we have an interesting observation. If you look more closely, and this was interesting, this is something that a, a class I was in at, at Harvard University among graduate students, a graduate seminar typically is the kind of thing where each graduate student is supposed to bring in, uh, is, is supposed to run the class for a, for a, for a topic. And so each of us bone up on whatever it is that we're supposed to do, uh, do for that class. And we come in and present for the class. The class discusses it uh, and that sort of thing. And, and so we were in a class with Stephen Jay Gould. We're studying the Cambrian explosion. That was, uh, that was the subject of the class. So at this point, so we're familiar with the Ediacaran fauna, the Timotian fauna, the Atbanian fauna. 
So alas, different graduate students get assigned Atbanian fauna, another person, Temotian fauna, another person, the Ediacaran fauna, another person, the, the, uh, the Acrotarx, another person. Yeah, so so we're, we've got a dozen students each uh, coming in each time with uh, different material. And after we were presenting and discussing this for a while, we began realizing that there's an interesting characteristic of these things. The Ediacaran fauna, I got those signatures on the wrong scheme. These two should be switched, sorry about that. Um, but the Ediacaran fauna almost invariably is found in sand. And that's interesting that any given fauna would be found in only one lithosome, only one type of rock. The, t uh, the Timotian fauna, sorry, it's misassigned, is, is uh, always in car carbonates. And the Atbanian fauna is always in shale. It's like, oh, wait a minute. This is something, something not right here. We've got a sequence of organisms, a sequence of faunas that are in, uh, they're each specific to a particular uh, type of rock. That's, it's a facies dependent, facies would refer to the type of rock, uh, that's a facies dependent uh, uh, faunal sequence. And that sounds a little bit, and we were discussing this, that sounds a little bit like Walter's law. Uh, there is this law that we, law, it's a, it's a principle in geology. If you see a series of different uh, lithosomes uh, stacked in a particular order, it could be that the order is due to a transgression event or a regression event where the first thing is formed in shallow water, the next thing is formed in deeper water, the next thing is formed in even deeper water. There could be that what you see vertically could be reflective of what the world was like horizontally at the time of deposition. So you're actually not looking at three different aged things, you're looking at three different things at different positions. So for example, on a typical understanding, traditional understanding of a, the shoreline, you've got sand uh, at the shore, you've got mud offshore, and you've got reefs out beyond that. So you've got sandstone, shale, sh uh, uh, mud shale, and then horizontally outward you've got carbonate. So if you see a sequence of uh, sandstone shale carbonate in a vertical sequence, you might think, well, what's actually going on here are three different uh, facies that existed side by side that are just, in this case, buried on top of one another because water came in over the land or something like that. So we recognize that this might mean that these three faunas are not are not separated in time, but are separated horizontally. That they're uh, horizontal expressions, three different fauna living at the same time. They get buried in sequence only because water's coming in or water's going out. Uh, and so at any given point in time, you got the shallow water critters and then the medium deep critters and then the deep critters uh, superimposed on top of one another, but they're not time, they're not, not different times. Now, this was disturbing to this group that <laughs> I'm talking with because, of course, there was traditionally understood a hundred million years of time here. So how do, you, how do you reconcile this? Well, fortunately, or maybe it's unfortunate, one of the, uh, a couple of the graduate students were assigned the issue of radiometric dating. And there was a radiometric revolution in dating of the, pre, of the Cambrian, Precambrian boundary occurring at the same time. And we recognized that there was a trend of redating all of these rocks. And rather than there being 100 to 150 million years, it was now down to about 20 million years. And it looked like it was going to keep going. And in fact, we concluded as a group that the data suggested that this whole unit wasn't 100 million years of time, but something less than a radiometric pixel at 5 million years. When you're fi 500 million years ago, the Cambrian, uh, 5 million years is 1%. That's a radiometric pixel. You can't see anything 
smaller than 1%. Arguably, you really can't see anything less than 10%. But you certainly can't see, can't distinguish the different ages of things. There's only 1% apart. And so we, even though it hadn't gotten there yet, it would, in, in, the, in the couple of years to follow, it would get there. Uh, we concluded that the radiometric data was suggesting that there's, no, there's less than a, an a radiometric pixel between these three faunas. Add that to the facies issues of the faunas, and we concluded these faunas don't represent successive faunas. They represent three faunas at the same time, buried, uh, buried in that order, but not living in that, uh, in that order. So... <clears throat> When you then, the, 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 but the, the, there, there became another issue that we, once we decided on that and were satisfied with that, we then thought, well, wait a minute, if there's only 12 places where this is found and they're all in the same sequence, how does that work? <laughs> we, we're, we're burying them in the same sequence, uh, suggesting that whatever process takes three different faunas that are side by side and buries them in a particular sequence is occurring at this, in the same way 12 different places around the world. At the same time, that was the next question. We then asked, okay, if uh, how closely can we determine the age of the 12 different deposits around the world? And again, we concluded that we cannot discern their age, uh, 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 we cannot discern differences in their age at the level of the radiometric pixel. So they might actually be all at exactly the same moment in time, uh, and that the same event, a global event, buried them in the same sequence bec in, in, in for that reason, which was getting more and more uncomfortable for the people that were in the group with me, and I was getting more and more excited about this. This is like, this is cool. <laughs> okay, this, this is a global event, no time is involved, and perhaps there's no time sequence involved at all. It suggests that, uh, in my mind, I'm thinking, we got a global uh, uh, inundation event, a global flood event. So we've got, this suggested that perhaps the uppermost Precambrian are actually the very beginning of the flood deposits and that they're preserving a pre-flood ecological sequence of some sort. Now let's turn to the upper Proterozoic diamictites, which are also part of the story. When you look at these puppies in detail, we begin to see some extraordinary things. It's hard to see in this particular photograph, but we have these things called exploded boulders. We're finding these boulders really big. And they're exploded. Um, if you draw a line around the boulders and, and that sort of thing, it's a little easier to do. It, it's often sometimes hard to do even in place, but you recognize that all the pieces are separated, but you can see where they could be put back together. The jigsaw puzzle pieces fit and just, just put them back, move them over a few inches and they just slip right into place. So the boulder in cross section looks like it's been blown up and then frozen right there. It's like, what in the world is that? We have, uh, we have phenomena called stirstroms, which are very large avalanche deposits. A stirstrom is caused whenever a pile of rock, something in excess of one billion metric tons, is dropped more than one kilometer. Uh, if you reach those conditions, even if, if it's in water, or if it's in air, or even in space, any one of those conditions, you drop more than a billion metric tons of rock one kilometer, what happens is a stirstrom results. So stirstrom is a Greek, a, Greek a, 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 a German word that means river of stone. It hits the ground and shoots out uh, at 100 to 200 miles an hour across the landscape as a river of stone, taking out cities, taking out, <laughs> this is rock, moving, and it moves as a unit until it reaches about 10 to 11 times its width in length, and then it loses its energy and freezes in place, not on a cold freeze, but a 
<laughs> and when you cut into the stuff and look at the boulders, those boulders that dropped a kilometer explode upon impact and the pieces move apart inches and then get shot along with everything moves at the same velocity, but sand and that sort of thing makes its way in between the pieces so that when it freezes in place, you have an exploded boulder. And so we know the mechanism of the exploded boulder. Now remember, this is a diamictite. It's supposed to be a glacier moving extraordinarily slowly over long periods of time and then melting the little puppy out. There's no mechanism for a stirstrom in that. In the, there's no stirstrom there. You, so that puts some doubt in this diamictite interpretation as a glacial deposit. A second problem is that these diamictites, which are found around the world at this particular level, are have, when you do paleomagnetic work on them, to indicate their latitude, latitude indicates they are basically at the equator. Okay, they're equatorial. Uh, there's some other evidence that indicates that, that they're, they're going over marine water. So they're equatorial ocean. Equatorial oceans are warm. That's not where you expect to find glaciers. You, don't, you find glaciers in mountainous regions. You do not find them at the equator. If you find them at the equator, they're on top of mountains. They're not associated with mountains, with, with equatorial oceans. But many of these uh, diamictites are low magnitude, near the low, low equatorial uh, mag, uh, latitude. So what's going on there? Uh, Inter-parenthetical note, by the way after this work was done in this, uh, since that time, the conventional world has actually taken note of this and taken this seriously and went, well, I guess that means there were glaciers at the equator across equatorial oceans. And so now there's another uh, period of Earth history called the cryogene, which is the period of frozen Earth. There's the, it's the period of a frozen earth idea that because the evidence indicates we have diamictites at the equator in the ocean, it must have been that the equatorial ocean was frozen. And if the equatorial ocean was frozen, everything's frozen, right? My question on that, and I'm still in that parenthetical note here, is if you've got the whole earth frozen, how do you move glaciers how do glaciers pick up rocks and move and drop rocks? They can't get, nobody can move. They're frozen. So the very evidence that was used to determine that this is a cryogene cannot be produced if there was a cryogene. You can't do it. I'm baffled by why in the world this became popular. And at one point it was suggested and man, it just went crazy. And it's currently, it's currently an actual uh, period of time in the geologic record, in the lithostratigraphic column, the cryogene. Are you kidding? But anyway, close parenthetical note. Uh, <laughs> there's the low magnitude, low latitude mag, paleomag evidence. This stuff is thick. It's in excess of a mile in thickness. The diamectite is huge. Diamectites produced by modern glaciers are tens of feet thick, tens of feet in, in depth. Uh, Pleistocene glaciation produced, again, tens, maybe up to 100 feet. There's 72 feet of, of um, uh, gravel uh, under Chicago. Uh, that's, that's a pretty deep, uh, uh, for, for Pleistocene glaciers, that's pretty, pretty deep. These things are in excess of one mile. They dwarf the any known glaciers we have today uh, quite significantly. And I think, actually, I, I had to stop doing research in this area because killed off all my, my assistants. They wouldn't come with me anymore. Um, but I was, I was deducing 
I think I was right on the verge of concluding that actually the true depth of this unit is something in excess of three miles. Uh, and, but that's, so I think it's even thicker than a mile. And also there are enormous boulders in here. Steve has made allusion to this. This is one of the smaller ones, about a quarter mile in diameter. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually funny, Steve and I started work on this area. We just happened to choose just this one place and we started work on this. We're taking uh, geological observation, making geological observations for days. And we're putting in faults and this sort of thing where you would put in faults because we changed the angle of the rock and all of this. And at the end of this, Steve says, you know, there's just something wrong here. <laughs> this is not working. Um, because our faults were beginning to define a circle. <laughs> it's like, you see, that's not what faults do. <laughs> And he says, do you think we're actually on a boulder? <laughs> you know, I mean, when you're on the ground and you got a, <laughs> something that big, how do you know that it's, I mean, we, we mapped for days on a boulder and <laughs> didn't realize we were on a, a one boulder. The boulder is itself with layers of rock. So there's a geology in the boulder. And, uh, but it doesn't match the geology of the stuff it's in. And eventually, you know, we got our heads screwed on right, and we realized, uh oh, this is a boulder, cool. And then that began a series of discoveries of boulders, bigger and bigger boulders. <laughs> we even rented a plane at one point to see this because he just can't see it from the ground. It's like, now, it's even better you can go on Google Earth. That's the best photos of these things is from Google Earth <laughs> because they're so big. Uh, this is amazing. So now here's a problem. When you get up to, and some of these are bigger, they're a mile, mile in diameter boulders. When you get to that mass, that size, they've got a fair bit of mass to them. There's a problem with, with ice. If you put enough pressure on ice, because of the strange characteristic of water that uh, upon freezing or very close to freezing, it actually expands, that if you put enough pressure on ice, it actually melts. This is the only substance that does that in the universe, okay? But if you put a big enough rock in ice or on ice, it melts the ice underneath it. The ice might be able to roll it in front of it, but it can't carry a boulder that is a mile in diameter. <laughs> it melts the ice underneath it. So we've got this problem of these enormous boulders. And they're not just enormous boulders, they're imbricated. They're laying on top of one another. It's like, yeah, you can't carry, you can't have floating ice carrying a boulder that big and dropping it onto the, as a drop stone. And it just don't work. So, suggests something is not right with the glacial interpretation. And again, here we have uh, boulders, big boulders out here, imbricated in place. Bunch of them. One layer with, doot, 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 there's three of them sitting on top of one another, imbricated. There's several more over here. These are, these particular ones are about a mile in diameter, about 200 meters thick, kind of dinner plate shaped things, sitting in place and, and stacked in this fashion. Just, you can't explain this as if there's a current or, or a, an avalanche direction in a particular direction, uh, which suggested to us that this is not at all a, uh, a glacial deposit. This is an avalanche deposit. You got the Sturstrom caused exploded boulders. You're carrying enormous boulders. So it's an enormous deposit uh, enormous avalanche deposit that apparently dropped a long distance, something in excess of, of one mile, uh, or one kilometer, sorry, at least one kilometer, and then shot quickly across the landscape, and it's, and it's, a, it's a, an avalanche deposit that's more than a mile thick. So this is a monstrous avalanche deposit. Uh, and the thing is about this that they, you can find these puppies the same age, around the world. So these are not glacial deposits. By the way, the striated boulders, that avalanche, that avalanche material, it's the same way glaciers uh, smooth out boulders and then striate them. This avalanche does the same thing to boulders. So we, got, we can explain all of the features, the diamictite and everything by this. 
But we find these crazy things through the middle of Australia, uh, through the middle of, of uh, Asia. <laughs> they're across, they're global uh, on their, and they're dated radiometric, within a radiometric pixel of one another. They're the same age. It's like, whoa, what's going on here? It suggests that we've got an event that created avalanches worldwide of enormous extent. Uh, what could this possibly be? We suggested that, in fact, this is the collapse of, a, of the pre-flood ocean, the edge of the ocean, uh, the edge of the continent before the flood. Big pieces of uh, continental mass broke off and fell into, again, you got a, in the current ocean, you've got four kilometers depth between the edge of the continent and the bottom of the ocean. So you've got, you've got the sufficient vertical for the, to get a Sturstrom kind of situation. And if it's a big enough hit, you can collapse the continental margins around the entire world. So we've got, uh, we're talking about the pre-flood flood boundary. And we've got a pile of rocks here in the Mojave and a pile of rocks in the Grand Canyon. We've got the discontinuities that are referred to before. Uh, and so we can put the, this allows us to determine where the pre-flood flood boundary is likely to be. And uh, I'm going to skip through this. You've already seen this particular diagram. We'd suggest that the pre-flood flood boundary is in these positions, basically at the base of the Kingston. We're in the middle of the Kingston Peak Formation uh, in the Mojave. Uh, and that puts the stromatolites below this point. So the stromatolites can be actually a preservation of a pre-flood world. Uh, the, where the position, uh, here, here we have a sequence of rocks leading up to the uh, the boundary, so these are pre-flood rocks. We have a whole bunch of pre-flood rocks, and for our purposes here, just to introduce the fact that there is intruded into them a very thick diabase. It's a very thick molten unit that was stuck into the middle of these sediments. And so if we look at the, what's underneath the stromatolites, is we have a lot of sediments formed by water, uh, which are intruded by a big diabase uh, sill. In fact, there's more than one sill. And so if we look at the history of this, we have the deposition of thousands of feet of sediment, which we suspect is due to the raising of continents and the running off of sediment from those continents. So we have a very big, uh, 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 very big, uh, what do you call it? Uh, package of sediment. Then we have the intrusion of an igneous unit in the midst of those sediments. And then it's later that we have the formation of, in that particular area known as the Beck Spring Formation, there's a number of evidences that indicate that it is in fact formed by hot water, probably from this diabase cooling. It's uh, getting off its heat the heat has been carried by water, and we're producing a limestone by hydrothermal activity. And it's, this is the context upon which the stromatolites are observed. So, and here's some of the evidences for the uh, hydrothermal activity, and I'm going to skip through that. In the Grand Canyon, we also have evidence of intrusion into sediments that we think were formed in day three of the creation week by the raising of the continents. Radiometrically, they are identical in age to that which is intruded into the Mojave Desert. That sill in the Mojave Desert is identical in age to these intrusions here. Uh, and chemi chemically, it is identical. In fact, it's identical to intrusions that are found in the mid-continent and uh, across uh, uh, an enormous area. It appears that there was, after the day three uh, regression, 
there was an intrusion across the North American Laurentian uh, area of this uh, huge body of, of hot molten rock that is then cooling by water coming up through it, picking up its heat, and uh, devolving onto the surface, taking this hot material and bringing it up to the surface, creating hot springs, very hot springs at the surface. It's in that context that we find the, uh, the stromatolytic reefs of the Grand Canyon. So it's my, it's my hypothesis that actually these, these stromatolytic reefs are formed in the hot water generated by, the, uh, by this intrusion. And that the reason that you don't have anything but bacteria in these rocks is because nothing else can live in these rocks. And it's specially designed, uh, these bacteria are specially designed for that hydrothermal situation. And it would probably decompose. It's probably why we don't even find the fossils of the microorganisms in the stromatolites. It would decompose organic matter. And probably even if there were uh, spores and that sort of thing that floated into this, that's all decomposed by the hydrothermal situation. And so we reconstruct the edge of the continent just before the flood as having a, a, a stromatolytic reef along the, uh, in this case, western margin of Laurentia with the uh, material underneath it is intruded by a, a hot, a very thick, hot um, magma that is producing heat at the surface, producing hot springs along here. So the only thing that can live here are the bacteria uh, generating these, these, uh, these reefs. That in turn produces a lagoon in between the uh, westernmost portion of the continent and the terrestrial portion of the continent. And in that lagoon, we can have uh, microorganisms li living there. I would suggest your Ediacaran fauna are living in sands that are at one particular location, probably deep because of their morphology. Tomotion fauna living in a carbonate environment. Uh, and the Atbanian fauna living in uh, muds that are closer to the land. And probably more than anything, it's the temperature of the water that is determining uh, what's living where in this particular sequence. Then, when the flood comes, comes along then, the, uh, that big earthquake at the beginning of the flood collapsed the margin of the continent. Uh, so, I haven't got there yet. For 1,600 years, we're building up stromatolites and critters are living happily and so on and so forth. And then at the beginning of the flood, there's a collapse of the continental margin around the world. Big, huge pieces of the stromatolytic reef of all sorts of things collapse into deep water, creating avalanche deposits into the deep water. That opens up or breaches the reef for the deposition of sequentially the, at, the Ediacaran fauna, the Timotian fauna, and the Atbanian fauna as it gets uh, carried in there by the undertow that uh, Steve was, was talking about. So, that wasn't, I need to work on that PowerPoint. <laughs> it's like, I'm always, always short on the PowerPoint. But anyway, that's the, uh, what we've got here is our inference this week on at least one pre-flood ecosystem uh, studying the rocks, uh, there's, again, a traditional interpretation of the rocks. There is a traditional conventional explanation for these rocks, that there's the evolution of communities through time, that there is, uh, there's glacial activity going on to produce the diamictites. But you look more closely, something's not quite right with that interpretation. You can't, you don't actually have the time sequence for the, uh, for the faunas. They're all living simultaneously at the same time, not evolutionary, not, not an evolutionary project, uh, progression at all. The diamictites are not actually generated by glaciers. Uh, you have to invoke a different mechanism, and as soon as you get a reasonable mechanism for them, you've got a catastrophic situation, which is, which is consistent with the catastrophe we hypothesize for the flood itself. 
So, and propose that there is or was a, a pre-flood ecosystem, hydrothermal reefs uh, made by bacteria in the pre-flood world that was never generated after the flood because we don't have those kind of conditions anywhere in the world after the flood. And that the uh, collapse of that system explains the order of the, uh, the early faunas, the early pre-Cambrian uh, macro uh, faunas that we find in the fossil record. Thank you.